First, I'd like to say thank you to who invited here and uh, thanks to all the research and community to work finally for the final customer using your te technology you are developing for the really end customer. And I'm talking from the view of an end customer, maybe somewhere between end customer and research, but globally an end customer. So what I'm doing a little bit to my own, uh, I'm the roadmap lead of our called data processing in Airbus. It is everything what's belonging to HPC, AI, big data, and blockchain, directly linked to our CTO. So really, the growth portfolio we have here where we're discussing about. I'd like to take you with me on a small journey to a real end customer and all the real problem to put everything up to scale, what we can do or what we do with these kind of environments. Have a lot, small, small introduction to the, our business, looking a little bit for HPC drivers in aircraft industries. What we have as an infrastructure is a small update compared to, com, to the former years. A little bit on limitations we talk about. We have, if we, if we use this kind of infrastructure, upcoming requirements and maybe some future challenges which are not solved up to now. If we look to Airbus, so if we look to Airbus, it's air, air business double every 15 years. So it's a lot of things already ongoing. So logically, we have something like 60 million jobs all over the world available running only aircraft business. That's not only Airbus, it's all over the world, including the airlines. And we have, we move around something like 50 million tons of freight around the world every year. So there's a lot of information we have, maybe as you may, or most of you flying in within plane. I don't care, care which was the vendor of, but logically we have 3.6 million of passengers by year. So really a large business we are driving forward. Uh, if we look to Airbus, that is only on Airbus commercial side. So we have roughly 400 operators, maybe some more already, flying our planes. And we have a luxury problem, but you will see that it's not only luxury, we have a backlog of aircraft already sold, but not produced, of 7,400 planes. If you go to, we you will see this afterwards, uh, it's a problem if you like to sell a plane now to a customer and you tell them you will make it in 10 years. Uh, <laughs> that's a reality. So if we talk about, we have roughly inside of Airbus Commercial uh, 56,000 employees. And that's what I said before. Globally, if we look to the Airbus fleet, we have a takeoff of an Airbus all over the world by 1.4 seconds, there's one takeoff on an, on an Airbus all over the world, average 24 hour a day. And if you see this, we're currently producing something like 60 planes by month. If you multiply these with a backlog of more than 7,000 planes, creates you a backlog of more than nine years. We have to work to produce planes in this area. There's a lot of challenges to manufacturing, and if you see this kind of combination, I think yesterday someone talked about we have maybe 40 terabytes of data delivered by a plane for a flight. If you multiply this with 20,000 flights, creates roughly one zettabyte of data by day. I, this will make a lot of uh, storage uh, supplier very happy to sell it, but we reduce the data before. We cannot store this all. But we like to keep some of this data already. We have a lot of contracts with some airlines deliver all the data to us. We don't keep care on all the data and reduce dramatically the data. So that's what we have, that's the final figures we have already available. So this luxury problem is, and this do doesn't count, you may have seen in the newspaper two weeks ago, one week ago, I don't remember, Chinese uh, airlines bought something like 200 plus planes. That means it's a quarter of a, uh, of a year production from Airbus. But we have to tell them, you can get the plane something around 2030. If we t multiply this, 10 years backlog means 2030. And that doesn't make a customer happy because you, we cannot produce more. And there are some limits I will talk about later on to you. There are limits which it's not so easy to overcome in aircraft business. What we have done, so you see the increase of the last years. We delivered each year roughly 10% more aircraft. 
but the 10% um, more aircraft is a huge increase of manufacturing targets and capabilities. We produce already in, for the single L on several final assembly lines in parallel. We have one final assembly line in Mobile, Alabama. We have one final assembly line in Beijing. We have two final assembly lines in Toulouse, and we have four final assembly lines in Hamburg. This creates really this throughput of data slash, uh, slash aircrafts by year. But you see our sales guy sold roughly year, last year the same amount of airplanes we were able to produce. So it's really balanced. That means we don't reduce our backlog. And that's really, it's an industry record we have done in 2018, really creating more planes, but selling more planes when compared to what we're able to create or to build. Really figures make it a little bit more difficult for Airbus. Airbus is distributed all over the world. As I said before, you have some facilities in the US. We have also a research center called A-Cube in Silicon Valley. So really distribute all over. So we have an engineering center in Beijing. And we have a lot of things inside of Europe crossover. And we have all the spares and research, uh, all the spares and support all over the world. So it's really distributed from Airbus and globally Airbus, including helicopters and defense and space, roughly 130,000 employees. What drives us from HPC side? We have done a lot the last roughly 20, 25 years for flight physics from these typically high-speed CFD simulation in the beginning to high-fidelity aerodynamic simulation to 3D modeling for engines and all the turbine, turbulences behind an engine to supporting all the flight tests for unsteady aerodynamics up to now that we are able to run complete laminar turbulence models already from aerodynamics point of view. And this aerodynamics is roughly up to now with 60% customer of the HPC systems in Airbus. It's a huge volume and there's a larger system behind to do all this. We have done a lot improved based that these kind of wind tunnel tests we normally run several years ago and this kind of model you pay easily a million for to get it and you pay roughly 100k by day in a large wind tunnel. So you see there's a really business case to run these, all these kind of simulation with simulation data set to make it more efficient to reduce the cost and to speed up the development of an aircraft. Development of an aircraft, that's also different to a lot of other companies you can do. Development of an aircraft means up to now something in the range of eight to 10 years. From kickoff a project up to delivery of the first plane. We're working hard to shrink it to maybe to an area of five to six years, but to reduce this, there's a lot of limitations to do dealing with certification every single round. So really this optimization is a lot where we spend a lot of effort and we make it more efficient for us and for you as a customer finally. If you have flown a new aircraft, it means not an old designed one, but maybe something like an A380, okay, we will not build any more of these, only a few, but also like in the 350, you can really hear, it is sometimes quiet, more quiet inside of the cabin. And there is a lot of research to do this inside. It's not only, okay, we build it and we see what's coming out, there's a lot of engineering research on this. So that's the reason why we're doing this in, all this in, air, in on the aircraft business. So we really like to optimize the performance. I'm quite sure Airbus is one of the companies building the best planes, but maybe not in the most efficient way to do this. So that's really the drawback to on the production side. We have to increase the maturity for entry into service to wait, to, uh, to not to waste too much time at this time for entry into service for a plane. Dealing with the complexity and decrease finally the lead time and cost as I talked before. And we are using, or the, our main users are all the engineering domains inside of Airbus. So that's the flight physics, as I talked about, the aerodynamics guys, 
structure, all the structure simulations, like finite element solvers and so on. It's a classical engineering area. Power plant, and this is something maybe interesting, not everyone is aware. Power plant, and means noise, noise reduction, inside of the cabin and outside. You have to run first a CFD calculation, where the CFD calculation creates some shock, uh, give you an estimation of shock waves somewhere on the wing or on the fuselage. And if you have done this, based on these shock waves, this indicates noise in the cabin and outside. You run, you start running an acoustic simulation on top of. You multiply this problem. So it's, it's a power two of problem sizing only on these, if you like to run acoustic simulations. So it's, uh, and a CFD is not simple. You can imagine what it means to run acoustic simulations. There is a lot of uh, research ongoing, and we are working hard with a lot of research in D2 to make this code for the acoustic simulation better. Then it's uh, all the systems and fuel. May you, yeah, as you are more, I think, working in the customer side on these, can you imagine that airliner coming with light designers to Airbus to have a look what the look and feel of the light and all the cabin illumination should look like to do this with Airbus. There's a huge business behind this from the airliner point of view, but we have to feed with all these. So there's all of these kind of systems lightning and really for sure in one, uh, multidisciplinary optimization. These are main drivers we're doing in Airbus to really get better business. But if you talk on aircraft industry, main driver is safety first. And that's, it's not only a wording. You will never, if you look to somewhere to our production facilities, you will never see people running. You will never see some waste somewhere. We have, in our production facilities, there are, from the certification authorities, independent people walking around, try to find if something going wrong. And if something going wrong, we have a huge problem with the production. It's the same for Airbus, it's the same for Bombardier or Embraer, so it's very harmonized on these. There are independent people on, in, on our facility and looking what we're doing in production. So it's really where we have to really keep, or, uh, keep care on. And on the certification administration, we have to certify not only the plane, we have also to certify the way the plane is built. So to changing something, and that's coming back to this production backlog, if you like to change something, we have to recertify the production chain. This means a lot of effort, and you spend a lot of money to do this. It's not so simple to do, and then we have to be very careful to do something in this area. This, it's not so easy as it looks like. You can do, but then you have a real problem behind. Finally, as a customer, you like to have a reliable system, because maybe the planes are more reliable and more on time than somewhere if you take a car or if you take a train somewhere. So that's uh, something what is really, we have to ensure, and if uh, you have a crash with a car or you have a crash with a train, train a little bit more difficult, happens somewhere. If you have a crash with a plane, you're on the first page of every newspaper all over the world. It's different business we are driving there. So this kind of reliability is one of the key topics we have to take care of from our side. What we have on current HPC infrastructure, this is what we have up to now. We have two HPC center, one in Toulouse, one in Hamburg, where we have the main information from uh, the main compute capacity in Airbus. These centers are also used by our helicopter guys from Marignan and from Donauwörth by remote because they made the decision four years or five years ago that they cannot do similar what we had done already several years ago on same size and quality uh, for the same price. The other location you can see these kind of grid services. It's the typical infrastructure where engineers run all their pre and post processing standard activities based on Linux systems. And it's roughly 1,000 servers distributed all over Europe. Uh, to the different locations, you have the data close to the engineers. And there is a small HPC center in Bangalore. This will be maybe removed, not so far away because we have now an accelerated 
wider line to Bangalore that enable them to run their computation tasks also in Toulouse and or in Hamburg. This is a global grid we are have on Airbus and working currently to have all our colleagues from defense and space inside. But defense and space is more critical in Europe because you have to deal with all the military regulations. Sometimes you have to keep the data inside of a country. You have to keep the operation inside of a specific country. So you are not so flexible to deal with. But logically, there is also a lot of stuff, especially in the space area, where we can consolidate this in, uh, these information and resources. But that is an ongoing task inside of this HPC and supercomputing area. That's uh, how the Airbus system looks like. So it's a classical HPC system. You have, or we have two types of compute nodes, some with more memory. You will see the specification a little bit afterwards. Some with less memory. You have a typically luster-based scratch environment. You have an infinite band. It's an FDR in between. And you have something like the admin nodes, the grid nodes, the transfer nodes to transfer the data, and login nodes for the end users available. And this is similar on both sides. You see the, uh, the uplinks. If we go with all the data pushing from HPC area to our standard environment, I'm quite sure that our backbones will die. <laughs> because if you're pushing into loose with 8 times 10 gigabit uh, data from a system, from an ISO subsystem to something like a filer-based storage, the storage server will be not happy. But this is what we have globally implemented in Airbus, so there's nothing artificial on this. So on this state, uh, we are currently, you will see up-to-date data. It's not 100% the reality up to now, because we are currently migrating from a former Ivy Bridge Broadwell architecture to a Skylake architecture. Half is done. Up, that means the development and the validation environment is already upgraded. The Toulouse environment is also upgraded. The Hamburg environment they start to upgrade in the next days. So it's, we are half the way already done. So we have this kind of infrastructure. So you have a little bit huge memory server, like uh, close to 400 gigabyte memory by node with some SSDs, local storage, for data-intensive application, logically. There is only not so much info, uh, notes on this, but the pure working system, it's, this disk is mainly to store the operating system. That's all. You can keep something on this, but nobody take care. So, and then you have the global notes, as I talked before. And also, it's operated, and that's what we had invented something like 10 years ago. We had, have a full service contract on this. You can call it cloud, but it's a private cloud, uh, where we had a set of use cases which described the performance we like to have in Airbus. And with use cases, with data, and this has to be executed in 24 hours. And this has to be certified and testified by the vendor get the offer, get, get the, uh, the purchase. But it's not a purchase, it's a rental contract for some years. And we have done this. It's a container-based solution. This container where the, formerly it was HPE, now it's DXC. They moved the operation to DXC over. We have it somewhere outside because the data centers are too expensive to build, so we pushed it in a container-based solution inside of the Airbus premises, but the premises is owned by DXA now, so it's a, like a contract, a legal contract behind. What we expect? to have this new system, something in the area of 3.3 paraflop, with roughly 60,000 cores based on Skylake. Up to now, we had uh, 85,000 cores based on Ivy Bridge and Broadwell. So uh, based on the better performance, we should have something in the area of 60,000. Uh, 60,000 in the area we had discussed with the when uh, the benchmarks it sounds that the benchmarks for Skylink are promising more than you can get out with the real application in reality. Maybe we will get some additional notes available, but this is the discussion we currently have with the vendor. So we, they have to justify this 24-hour benchmark. If it doesn't fit yet, they have to add some notes. So that's, and then you have something like 2.8 petabyte of scratch and some midterm storage. This is storage close to the node to avoid some data transfer. <coughs> it will be not 
moved, but it will be not back up. So really, for operation tasks, uh, uh, 700 petabyte, uh, terabyte of storage there. Limitations we have in Airbus. Yes, you may know this graph from all the conferences. It's this updated version that we have increase of transistor by socket, but the single thread performance decrease, even maybe stable. Typically, you have more cores, but the frequency of the single core is decreasing. If you link this with a lot of applications, and we, uh, I will come later on on this, applications are not scalable, especially in our area, as we expect in some cases. So this becomes more and more a problem, because logically, you get with a new system less performance out of the existing system. So how to sell this to a customer? Tell them you have to wait longer to get the same result. It's not the best way. <coughs> and globally, the typical power is stable the last 15 years. I know that. Some windows are now talking about we like to go for water cooled system to heat it up the ship a little bit more, okay. But linked to the operational task, I'm not sure this is really reliable in, in production system area because then you have to switch off and switch on with the water cooled system, creates always a lot of time, a lot of problems because water and electricity don't like together. That's normally the problem of this kind of water cooled system, which you need if you like to go to something in the area of 400 watt by socket. So this is a problem we're already facing from our side. The second problem we are facing, we are running on our application area roughly 60 different applications in our HPC systems. And if I look to the top five or top six of the last top 500 systems, I can only can find six different processor types slash accelerator types. That means we are going to diversity. So all these, you can see the NVIDIA, Power, <coughs> Intel, Xenon, Phi architectures, but which application really work on each of these very well? And for me, quite sure, as we already have seen, AMD, well, I expect AMD in summer, latest in uh, November, back somewhere on the list, on the maybe top five, top 10, I don't know. But there, is a, there will be also an AMD processor very soon. So it will create more diversity. And also if you have these kind of nice processors, in the smartphone, where you talk about ARMs, most of these smartphones have already two to four different processors inside, creating more diversity, but keep this application running on all the different processors. I, I know for academia, it's nice to have always the best performance. Looking from industry point of view, you need something what is reliable for a huge set of applications. And we have to deal with these. Oh, oh, sorry. And that's one of the problems we have. Software is, in commercial area, one of the major blocking points, or the major blocking point. Most of, most of the engineering software have been developed somewhere in the 70s, 80s, if you're lucky, in the 90s, last century, and not refurbished anymore. That's something from IDC, and I fully agree on this point. And for a lot of applications, you don't need HPC in future. If you have a node with 84 cores, this will fit with a lot of standard ISV application. Why you need HPC? You need really high scalable code. <coughs> and the problem we have on this is that it's a lose-lose game for the ISVs. If the ISVs spend a lot of money to rewrite their code, it's a waste of money from the, and time from their side. And we, as a customer, will buy less licenses. As the code is more efficient, we don't need so many licenses. So they lose two times the money. So we have to find solutions for this problem. This is really a problem I discussed with a lot of automotive industries, with the uh, with machine industry, with aircraft industry, <coughs> discussing together this Boeing on the same side of the table. It's not secret because 
we have all the same problem together. This is really one problem we are facing. And in the academia area, you can spend a lot of time to optimize your code for a specific architecture. In the eyes, we don't have the money and we don't have the capabilities to do this. We, don't, we like to buy some codes from somewhere. If I look on, <coughs> sorry, on this chain, in some areas we do something. High C scalable CFD solver. Um, association inside of Europe rewrote the existing CFD solver. The current code name is Flux, called R. They renamed it to Coda. Uh, <coughs> this code, it's a CFD code from developed by DLR and Honora, uh, together with MTU, Airbus as a customer site. So there's a lot of things ongoing. And high scalable means scaling up to more than 100,000 cores by execution for a single task. Really, it's high scalable. That's what I mean with scalable application we need for other areas. If I look on this, AMD ROM processor will be more, will be up very soon, especially that we have a lot of memory bounded application in our portfolio. And finally, the ROM processor gives you a quarter more of bandwidth to the memory. That's the reality. And the CPU will become more a data mover that I see from the tendencies. The performance you get mainly out of the accelerator, vector units, FPGAs, however you call it. A little bit some tendencies I can see what's going on. <clears throat> and for me, also working with them partially, I'm become a serious player. Up to now, they are not on the scale and level of a Skylake processor, but I think they are not so far away and we will see them very soon in this area. But this is a global outlook, how I see the market is evolving. A little bit more on the upcoming requirements. If I look where Airbus is working on, <coughs> I had a look to the Gardner hype curve from 2018, it's the last available hype curve. I made uh, some red bubbles, only what we are working already on. So you see something like neuromorphic computing, you see from my roadmap the blockchain, the neural uh, the deep learning activities, digital to twin is something where we are working hard. You will see this afterwards on. All these automotive things, automotive means not driving cars, maybe also doing the same in the factory. On the, all the deep neural networks and on quantum computing, you will see something around this very soon. That's all where we spend some effort on research inside of Airbus, research or production implementation, somewhere in between. <coughs> If it discuss with our aerodynamic guys, they told me, okay, we have done a lot in the 80s and 90s on these uh, random average Navier-Stokes equations for high speed, for low speed, and for unsteady. That's where we are. But they tell me also, if we like to run, really fly a virtual aircraft, we may need something around 2030 set up flop system. They don't talk about exaflop, they talk about setaflop system. Uh, some question, do we get it? Quite sure, no. We will not have with the current architecture something in this range, but this would require from our aerodynamics guys to fly a plane virtual. Otherwise, you have to run a lot of things by test. You cannot simulate everything what's going on there. If I see another trend, from the user forum, I think from 2017, 2018, I don't know when I picked it up. It's from Hyperion, yes, 2017. The increase of machine and deep learning. I agree with this curve. Maybe it's not, uh, it should be more like this than like this. It's shown, but maybe I'm wrong on this. But I see a lot of things going on in the AI and yeah, deep learning activities. Give you one example. What we are doing up to now is we have some physics with maths. We formulate a model, execute these with a simulation, make out of the simulation an analysis and a prediction of stress, aerodynamics, whatever. This deductive top down approach. It's a classical simulation approach we are running. <coughs> we already had done a lot of data and 
people start thinking, why not taking the data, build new neural network based on the existing simulation data we already have available, and learn from past models, and to run simulations based on these past models, this bottom-up, the inductive approach, and predict out of these. <clears throat> and I've seen some use cases which deliver more or less same results in shorter time than the simulation approach. That's where also colleagues are already working on. So really, future simulation will take benefit of the HVC and the big data and machine learning. So we need this in a combined way. Also see that more and more application coming on, or ideas coming on to analyze data, which are here, with big data analytics to avoid this human understanding on everything which take time and take effort. You can automate this. And if you like to run an optimization loop, <coughs> you easily can move out the human out of the loop, which helps a lot to get a better performance out of the system. System means for me the whole development chain. That's what we, see. we already can see what's ongoing in Airbus. Um, coming back to this production area, what I show you now, it seems very simple. You have something like a real fuselage, you have a camera system like a tablet, and you put an overlay with a PDM model in. From academic point of view, no problem to do. If you like to do this in a manufacturing environment, that means you put, have to put this inside of a fuselage, or a VLAN unfriendly environment. You have no VLAN signal inside. Uh, you need a positioning of roughly half a millimeter, millimeter, because the structure is re, uh, always more or less similar to, uh, between the different areas. So you need a positioning inside of a fuselage or inside of a wing. Don't take care, both is logically from our side itself, the same. And the, you have to do this in a production line, where the fuselage is shifted every four to six hours to a new position how to install and how to get this kind of theoretical, simple system running. And what we like to do with the, for the blue colors, really have an overlay and mark all the bolts which are not done at the right way. Coming back to certification, all bolts which are maybe half a meter out of the real design space has to be justified and to be reported each bolt. We have some hundred thousand bolts inside of an, of an aircraft. This is part of documentation we have to do. We like to help the engineers or the blue colors to do this in a better and quicker way. Really compare these. Some, and you like to do, have to do this maybe with 20 or 40 blue colors in a fuselage in parallel. Think about bandwidth you have to bring in an unfriendly environment. And a uh, manufacturing environment is by definition unfriendly because you have a lot of metal disturbance around you. It's not so easy to do with these. Really, production environment, you cannot deal easily like a laboratory environment with these. Only gave you some ideas on scale. Simple, simple use case, but to run it on scale, sometimes more difficult to do. <clears throat> Something on future challenges we have in Airbus. Airbus already, or in the past, was really looking for new technologies, for new infrastructures. I have a slide later on. The first uh, two-pilot cockpit was an Airbus cockpit. Fly-by-wire was an event, uh, something invented by Airbus in this area. So there are a lot of things ongoing on this. And we have a lot of ideas and vision what we like to do. One is, if I look to our business, we need, as I explained before, a harmonized environment between HPC, high performance data analytics, and maybe as a mean like cloud for burst capacity. And we have to put somewhere in hybrid HPC and in AI in these kind of bubbles. This is global architecture view, not talking about physics, but we have to deal these together. If I look on these and if I look to all the means we have inside of Airbus. I call it data-centric architecture. We have a lot of data, or create a lot of data. One data area is, as I have shown before, all the simulation we are running. 
creating small and uh, finishing with a lot of data. There's a factor of 1,000 easily between. Input is typically somewhere in an area of some 100 megabyte, may up to a gigabyte. Output is normally somewhere in the range of 10 gigabyte to 100 gigabyte of simulation. Very typical use cases, but you do this with a lot of things in parallel, so you have to do something with the data. We will have, from the manufacturing side, more and more IoT devices running. Think about a um, final assembly line where we create aircraft, where you have maybe some hundred thousand IoT devices. If you have uh, the blue colors equipped with Google glasses, HoloLenses, however it's called, with handheld devices like uh, the screwer and so on, to really understand and justify what you, what you are doing with and do all the automatic registration of information on these, there are a lot of IoT devices to be done. There will be a lot of data, including humans which are available, including supply chain information, which part is available, something around these. There's a lot of things you will get from IoT devices. You have information from the PLM, MES system, PLM, uh, uh, product lifecycle management system, manufacturing, engine, uh, manufacturing execution system. That means all the information you can have what is done or should be done, which finally define to, be, as build, uh, to build or as build. You like to run on all these data, big data analytics, because you like to have these data to run, for example, predictions uh, out of the execution and manufacturing data and run prediction out of the same data. It's the same data for us. You have to run maybe some uh, deep or machine learning, mean AI, run, the, uh, run for example some predictions out of this information. And the data are not independent. If you run simulations, you like to run, as I explained before, big data analytics on this data. You like to have maybe learn from the data for the future. There's a link of data in between. If you have IoT data, you will analyze this data by big data analytics to make predictions. You will see a little bit more on this later on, the next slide, and you will have maybe some decision-making processes based on this data. Then you have the PLN, MES data, also public data like weather forecast data. If you look to airplanes, to, to our customers finally, uh, there will be a lot of data also from public. You like to run out of these big data analytics to combine with all the data you have on this side and maybe run some deep learning algorithm or machine learning algorithm on this area. And finally, big data analytics will feedback some information to the simulation, same as AI. So it's all about data and what is required, and that's for me is the challenge we have. You talked about the, to process the data, but how to store the data in a harmonized format. I don't like to replicate the data for, uh, three times or four times. You cannot copy the data. We talk about at least petabytes of data to be managed in this area. And they, you have to run really quickly analysis on this data. Because then you need something like an HPC system to run big data analytics, high performance data analytics, and parallelize code. There's a real use case behind that what we are currently doing and the factor of the future where we invest a lot of money in. If we start with the horizontal integrations, I think that's it. everyone know what's going on. We have this kind of engineering design development of an, of an aircraft, finally. We have the manufacturing, and we have the in-service. This horizontal integration of a product, it's more or less okay. I would not say perfect, but okay. To run a digital twin to compare as built and as designed. It's one digital twin. A lot of people talk about digital twins, but we have multiple digital twins. Be careful on this. If you look on the vertical integration, as I said before, on the shop floor, you have a lot of devices help the blue colors to manufacturing these. Could be small one, could be large one, could be everything, could be glasses, could be hololenses, whatever you have. Then you have the execution system creates for the blue colors and for all for the machinery work orders what has to be done. 
And this is linked with the resource planning of the company. What is required? Do we have to buy something new? Do we have to order something in the supply chain? All these ERP systems, that is the vertical integration. What is up to now in most of the industry relatively poor. We have a lot of things ongoing. We keep across running with these, but there's a higher manual effort to do this. We like to run a really a digital twin for the vertical part. That means have a, the factory as a model and all the resources feed it in from supply chain, from materials, from all the parts inside of this kind of system. And the target for the third step, where we are not now, but starting, we have a lot of planning already ongoing on this, to run a full integration of this, a full optimization process. This is something where you deal with data and challenges to deal with all the data and run analysis and simulations in parallel on the same data. And that's the vision of our factory guys. <clears throat> if you have a look, starting a little bit more from the end, in Hamburg we have four, as I said before, uh, four final assembly lines. Maybe in some, you miss some parts to be delivered in time, maybe some hours late. There are some people sick, there are some manufacturing devices out of order, whatever happens. But you can push the other resources maybe to another assembly line very quickly. You have to do this in minutes. So you have to keep all the data available, you have to run simulation in parallel, and may make, and that's the global vision, make decisions by an AI out of this information to say, hey guy, go to this final assembly and go there and continue this kind of work. But this requires something like quarter of an hour prediction, half an hour prediction analysis from keeping the data, running a simulation and make decisions. This cannot be done manually. Up to now, we waste a lot of time in this area. What we are doing in parallel, as you can see, something like this, working on exoskeleton, which helps the blue colors, support them with autonomous devices to deliver all spare parts, all what they need, all the handheld devices, whatever they need, to them directly where they are working, to avoid that they have to run around. Then, talking to the customer, what they like to have from Airbus, looking to designer to run virtual designs and also taking into account for the designs how to do this in an efficient way and really deliver maybe different type of aircraft very soon. Give you one figure on delivering aircrafts. As you as a passenger normally see only the cabin. A single air cabin, we create roughly one new head of version every week. That means we have one new customer for a cabin every week inside of Airbus. A cabin has roughly 100,000 connection points to the structure. And every point can be only used once. That means electricity, communication devices, water, you have the galleys, you have the laboratories, you have all the security equipment, you have the entertainment system. That's 100,000 connection points in a plane, like a single L is a small plane. But you have to deal with this linked to the customer requirements to modify this for the customer every week. For every head of version, because the customer normally has a chunk of planes, they buy five or ten planes, which should have a look, look and feel, same look and feel. But this is some work to be done. There are something like AR uh, or virtual reality can help, maybe also to be distributed to the customer. That's some physical requirements you have in Airbus. As you can see, really run this simulation on optimized model in parallel with a high speed. Nevertheless, Airbus invests already a lot in quantum computing. This is an official challenge out from 10th of December last year on the QTB conference in, uh, in California. You can have a look on this. Um, it's officially communicated. And we like to have feedbacks from the quantum community based on five areas. It is only the area of flight physics. You can see a little bit more in detail what we are talking about. We like to have aircraft climb optimization running. If you have a takeoff, you can give full trust to the engine, going up to a very high altitude very quickly. If you're on high altitude, you save fuel. But the climbing on a hard angle 
you consume a lot of energy, that means fuel. If you go smoothly up, uh, then you have maybe a lot of impact to the noise to the ground, and maybe you burn for a longer time some more fuel. So what is the trade? There are a lot of parameters in these, and there is no, not really visible optimal solution for these. And that's what we have seen. We have finished some quantum computing projects already. We have, I have finished one two years ago. So they're really something what we already have done. It's this multidisciplinary or the multi-parameter optimization, and I talk multi-parameter in the range of some hundreds, not only tens. It's really something what you have to do in this area. The same is on maybe someone has a good idea on computational fluid dynamics, CFD code to be replaced on a quantum physics system. Not Navier Stokes. Navier Stokes will not work on a quantum uh, physics system up to now. But maybe there are other ideas, algorithms to do something in this area. Quantum neural networks for solving partial di differential equations. So we have something to optimize inside of a fuselage multi parameters. This is a simple case, it looks like a wing box design optimization. But if you see the different a wing box, if you fly and if you're on ground, it's not stable, it's flexible. So changing the aerodynamics, changing the mechanics, the stability, and so on. So run this optimization is something like an envelope of 600 parameters you have to optimize. What we are doing is running 600 times design of experiments and try to build an envelope what covers the best solution, but it's, it's human. This is a problem potentially for, could be interesting for the quantum system. And also loading, it's more for our customer side, but we are looking how to optimize the loading. If you put, uh, I don't know if you know what's the physics behind the plane, you create a lot of lift with the wing, and you destroy the wing, uh, the lift with, with the stabilator to get a stable uh, system. That's logically the flight physics basics. But if you put a lot of load, into the tail, you don't have to destroy the uplift with the, with the tail. You can put it. But as you're changing during flight the fuel, this will change the stability of the plane. So you have to be careful that you're not bouncing the boundaries. There are a lot of things you have to take into account. There is a, we have made an assessment there are roughly 60 to 70 different parameters involving and only loading an aircraft in an optimal way. And you have, if you do this, an airplane, an airliner, has half an hour to do this. You cannot run an optimization half an hour, so it's best guess what they do. But we really can save fuel on this. Only some ideas, if you like, on the, if you like to see, on this page, you can get it. It's, it's an airbus.com page. There you, have, you can register, and then you get all the physical details on the mass behind. You can get it from, for your own. It's an official challenge. We'll run up to October this year. It's out since December. So there's also the, the barcode there. You'll find the information there, if you like. Only gave you some ideas what Airbus is doing in this area. And as I said before, we are looking, as you can see, for a lot of in innovation. So the first twin-engine white body, the fly-by-wire, the double-decker, the 380, uh, the manufacturing, yeah. We're looking for a lot of advanced materials. I don't know if you're aware on 3D printing. 3D printing we run already. We have roughly plastic printing 100,000 parts already in the air from the other side. But we're working a lot on metal printing. That's mean melt titanium. If you like to run a simulation, you, if you melt titanium in a powder bed area, this takes roughly six hours for a normal chamber size to be built. You have layer on 0.1 millimeter, a little bit less partially. The lasers are very quick. In a simulation, it takes at least three times the time where a laser needs to build this. So the simulation is three times slower than to run production. So you cannot do this. What we are doing is also there is a research project ongoing. You have to take picture by each layer where you have melt titanium, that means 
really 1,200 degrees, try to analyze this information from the melt pool data, run AI on this data to predict porosity or to predict potential cracks in future already as built process. Then we have something, uh, unfortunately, Axel is not here. I had discussion with NVIDIA and Axel on this point, maybe that we have some research correlation in this area. There's a lot of things ongoing in this. Nobody over the world can do this. So we spend also something like this. It's not pure HPC, but the simulation is pure HPC. You have to run something like eigenvalue calculation. To, if you melt it, if you cool it down too quickly, you get something with the wrong shape out of, out of the chamber. There's this kind of prediction to run. There's a lot of research. Nobody knows. There are ideas ongoing, but nothing available over the market. You can talk to Autodesk. You can talk to Simu, uh, to oh, that's who is too far away on these uh, there's materials. There are some companies over the world, Siemens, doing some research together with us. So really research in this area. It's not pure HPC, but you see the links to the HPC area because you have to run all these simulations in this area. And that's, for me, it's the end of the small journey to real customer requirements from the other side. Hopefully, if there are any questions.